Bon, bonjour à tous. Donc, euh, ben, bienvenue pour le séminaire de, de Cyril. Alors Cyril, pour ceux qui sont à l'IAP, vous le connaissez tous puisqu'il est, euh, est chargé de recherche au CNRS. Il a rejoint l'Institut en, en 2012. Avant cela, il a, il a fait sa thèse. Il a très mal été encadré, mais il a fait sa thèse avec moi. C'était quoi De 2005 à 2007 À 2008. Et, 2008. et je me rappelle la première fois où il est venu à l'Institut, c'était en 2004, donc il est venu me voir pour discuter pour une thèse, mais il a dit « je ne peux pas tout de 2005. suite parce que là, je pars en Argentine ». Et donc euh, après, après l'école normale supérieure à Lyon... Il je a... partais au Pérou. Au Pérou, c'est ça. Il a pris une année sabbatique avant de commencer sa thèse entre l'école normale et, 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 et sa thèse, parce qu'en fait il m'a expliqué que comme ça il était sûr de pouvoir rester enfermé dans son bureau pendant très longtemps, il avait pris l'air et il avait vu un peu le, le ciel. Donc euh, sa thèse, c'était principalement sur des, des problèmes de théorie de, de perturbation cosmologique, aussi bien en théorie cinétique avec l'équation de Boltzmann de façon non linéaire, et puis dans les espaces anisotropes. Je me rappelle que le jour de ta thèse, tu avais dans ton jury euh, David Spergel, et qui a dit que chacun des sujets aurait pu valoir une thèse, et que d'après lui, ça faisait partie des deux meilleures thèses qu'il avait vues dans sa vie, l'autre étant celle de Zaldariaga, qui était prof à, à Princeton. Donc ça avait été euh, un moment... Euh, voilà. Très, très, très beau. Et suite à ça, tu as, eu la, tu as reçu le prix jeune chercheur de la Société française de, de physique. Donc Cyril est, est voilà, théo, spécialiste de, de théorie des perturbations. Je pense qu'en ce qui concerne l'équation de Boltzmann non linéaire, tu dois être le spécialiste mondial. Euh, il, a, il a aussi développé, pour tous les, tout, en fait, tout, sur tous ses travaux, il développe des codes qu'il rend public. Donc il y a ce, le fameux CMB Quick qui permet de faire vos, vos courbes de CMB euh, en Mathematica euh, avec les, les corrections non linéaires. Euh, tu as fait la même chose avec Xpand pour les calculs formels de, de théorie des perturbations. Et là, tu vas nous parler du, 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 de la nucléosynthèse primordiale. Et donc, tu viens d'écrire un code qui s'appelle Primat, donc euh, Primordial Matter, hein, qui n'est pas d'ambiguïté sur le, sur le nom du... Hein, c'est pas Fiat Lux, c'est Primat. Et, euh, et ce qui est intéressant, c'est que là, tu, finalement, donc on a beaucoup travaillé ensemble, ça a toujours été un honneur pour moi et puis un plaisir en fait, de, de discuter avec toi. Et depuis deux ans, tu as, tu as rejoint un peu le, voilà, le petit groupe de personnes qui fait de la nucléosynthèse à l'Institut. C'est un sujet un peu historique à l'Institut d'astrophysique, à la nucléosynthèse primordiale. Et il y a eu un beau passage de relais en, en revoyant un petit peu les codes qui avaient été développés, en particulier par Alain Coq, Elisabeth Vangioni, d'intégrer un certain nombre de corrections astrophysiques pour être sûr qu'on avait un code qui était à la précision euh, bah, de, sous le pourcent, mais ça tu vas, tu vas nous en parler. Donc voilà, ça c'est en gros, il faut juste aussi dire, qu'est-ce que je dois dire aussi Ah oui, donc Cyril est, est un super bassiste, il a, il a eu plusieurs groupes de rock, donc c'est vraiment une rock star, et je crois que le seul point vraiment de désaccord qu'on peut avoir, c'est il, il a eu un groupe, c'était je crois ton deuxième groupe, où vous aviez de la musique, c'était un peu entre Pink Floyd et Iron Maiden, et là je crois qu'on n'était pas tout à fait d'accord sur, sur cette ligne éditoriale. Mais à part ça, c'est toujours un, voilà, un vrai plaisir de, de discuter avec toi. Et pour ceux qui veulent, qui vont aimer le séminaire, donc c'est comme, voilà, je fais le merchandising, il y a le livre du séminaire après, qui est le Physics Report que, qui a été publié. On en a quelques exemplaires, vous pouvez les, tu, en as, tu sais toi qui les as, donc tu peux, vous pouvez demander à Cyril si vous voulez tout savoir sur la nucléosynthèse primordiale. Les quatre auteurs sont encore vivants, ils peuvent même vous le dédicacer, mais c'est plus cher. Voilà, je te laisse parler. Okay. À toi. Thank you very much. Can you hear me correctly? Yes. Okay. So yes, as uh, Jean-Philippe said, uh, this work is in collaboration. It's important to state it with uh, with him and with uh, Alain Coq and Elisabeth Vanjoni, who are specialists of nuclear physics. So the first uh, 20 minutes of my talk, I'm going to review uh, nuclear physics very briefly, just. Uh, to, to set the context in which uh, this work has been done, and cosmology. And cosmology is going to be very brief because it's only homogeneous cosmology. Then, uh, the, the, last, uh, the, the remaining 40 minutes, I'm going to discuss about uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So let me start with nuclear physics. The idea that um, the chemical elements could have been formed in the early universe dates back from 1948, and it dates back from this uh, paper by uh, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma, which is very famous. In that, pa so that paper, in, in some sense, is, is, is quite wrong because in that paper they claim that all the elements were uh, synthesized during the early universe. But still, the idea remains that uh, some elements, or at least a fraction of the elements, have been synthesized during the early universe, and that's what is called today a big bond nucleosynthesis. So now today, the, um, the current picture about uh, the synthesis of uh, elements is that the very light elements, that is hydrogen, helium, helium-3 and helium-4, and hydrogen under the form of deuterium, have been uh, synthesized during the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, that is the first uh, few seconds of the universe. <coughs> then the lithium-beryllium bore, they are uh, mainly due to the spallation from cosmic rays. 
then the heavier elements are uh, created uh, in stars, and then the even heavier elements they are created in violent events, on which I'm not a specialist at all. So I'm going to discuss only this part, you know, the, the first few uh, light elements. And um, usually, the way to represent uh, nu nuclear physics, uh, no, sorry, nuclear, uh, nuclei, is through the Mendeleev uh, table. Why? It's because in this table, we organize the elements according to their chemical properties. But that's not quite what we want to do here. Because, for, for uh, sorry, what's, uh, okay, here I have a problem. Okay, it's good. It was not working. So yes, for nuclear physics, we really want to describe the nucleus, uh, and for the nucleus to describe it correctly, we need two numbers. We need the number of neutrons and the number of protons. So instead of organizing things according to the number of protons, and then to state what is the the isotope. Then we use this two-dimensional chart. The, the, number, the, the element which is 0, 1, 0 proton and 1 neutron obviously is neutron. And then the number which is 1, 0 is hydrogen. And then we'll have a more complicated and more complicated uh, nuclei once we go uh, up this chart. So the question is, how can we s create these very first few elements here uh, during the early universe? So first, let me uh, just summarize my notation because I'm going to use colors to, to show the, re the various reactions. So the colors I'm going to use is the light blue, uh, pale blue for electrons, then red for protons, and uh, dark blue for neutrons. So protons and neutrons, we refer to them collectively as nu uh, nucleons because they are the particles inside the nuclei. And the, the main difference between the electrons and the, the nucleons is the fact that for, for reactions involving electrons, then the typical energy scale is of the order of the electron volt. So for instance, if you take the the capture of a proton of an electron by a proton, which creates an, uh, an hydrogen atom, then typically this releases 13.6 electron volts. So, and for all uh, all chemical reactions, which somehow corresponds to rearrangements of the electrons, the energies involved are always of the order, are actually smaller than the electron volts. For nuclear reactions, so the, this is the most simple, uh, in some sense, chemical reaction. This is the most simple nuclear reactions for all. Uh, nuclear reactions, the energies involved are the order of the mega electron volts. So as you see, uh, there is a factor 10 to the, 10 to the 6, and that's what is uh, so important. This factor is so important for cosmology, and I'm going to explain why in a, in a few minutes. So here, for instance, if you take a proton and a neutron, you combine them into a bound state, which is deuterium, then the energy release is 2.2 mega electron volt. And this 2.2 mega electron volt is quite important for big bond nuclear synthesis, so please uh, rem remember this uh, number. So first, there is a a very, a very important difference between the synthesis of elements in stars and the synthesis of elements in the early universe. In stars, we don't have free neutrons because neutrons decay. We only have protons. And that's why if we want to form heavier nuclei, since in nuclei we have both protons and neutrons, at some point we need to convert protons into neutrons. That is, we need weak reactions. So for instance, here, that's the typical uh, the Wikipedia moment. It's the typical reactions that you have in the stars. You start with two protons and two protons, but you see, to get deuterium, you have to transform this proton into uh, a neutron, and this is an inverse beta uh, reaction. And this is quite slow, because typically this is a weak interaction, so it's, a, it's, a, it's very weak. And that's why it takes so much time uh, to synthesize uh, helium-4 and heavy elements in stars, and stars keep burning their fuel for billions of years. Now, for cosmology, it's quite different, because in cosmology, we're going to have neutrons from the very beginning. So we can use directly the neutrons which are in the early universe. So that's why uh, nuclear synthesis can be very efficient uh, in the first few seconds. And in order to understand how, how many neutrons we have in the early universe, we have to do cosmology. So cosmology is very uh, relaxing when you're working in BBN because when you're a specialist of GR and, uh, and, cosmolo and uh, relativistic cosmology, then you can forget about everything except the Friedman equation. The Friedman equation is the consequence of the Einstein equations for, the, for an isotropic and homogeneous universe. That is a universe which is only described by the scale factor. And so when you write the Einstein equation, then you have the equation that the, 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 the rate of expansion, a dot over a square, is uh, related to the energy density. So it's the famous uh, thing that h square is a pi j divided by three times the energy density. And uh, it's even simpler in the early universe because in the early universe, we are completely dominated by radiation. The energy content is uh, not, do not dominated by matter as it is the case today. And radiation, we know its, its energy density is scaling like rho radiation today, I should have put today here, divided by the scale factor to the 4. And why the scale factor to the 4? It's very easy. It's because we have dilution, which is uh, decreasing the, the number density by a factor 
by a scale factor a to the cube. And then we also have the fact that the typical temperature, sorry, the typical energies of photons is uh, redshifted by the expansion. So the energy is going like one over the, the wavelength and the wavelength is redshifted. So the energy is scaling like one over the scale factor. So the energy density is number density times energy of photon is going like one over a to the four. And so then when you want to solve this equation, a dot over a square is a constant divided by a to the four, then you just uh, do it on the back end envelope. And what you found is that the scale factor is scaling like uh, the square root of, uh, of time, of cosmic time. Then we also know that for a relativistic species, for instance, a black body for, uh, for photons, the energy density is scaling like the temperature to the four. So we have that the energy density is scaling like temperature to the four and scaling like one over scale factor to the four. So if we plug that, uh, if, we, if we compare it with this equation, then what we conclude, and it's very important in BBN to remember this, is that the temperature square is scaling like the inverse of time. So you see, when you want to decrease the temperature by a factor 10, you need to wait 100 uh, times as much. And that's, uh, that's going to be very important in, um, in BBN. So another thing which is crucial for BBN is that you have to compare the number of uh, uh, baryons. So by baryons, we mean uh, protons and neutrons here when we say that. Well, actually, we mean protons, neutrons, and electrons, but electrons are very light, so we can say that it's what is important here is the number of uh, neutrons and protons. And it's about 10 to the minus 7 per, per, centimeter, cu per centimeter cube. Now, if we compare it to the number of photons, we see that the number of photons is, is much higher. It's 400. So there is a, ra there is a factor which is of order uh, 10 to the 9. It's rough order of magnitude. There are 1 billion more photons than uh, uh, neutrons in per unit of volume t in today's universe. And this is about numbers, not about energy. So this doesn't change because it's only affected, I mean, doesn't change very much. It's only effective, affected essentially by dilution. However, today, these photons, even though they are a factor 10 to the 9 more uh, numerous, they are, they are a factor 10 to the 12 less energetic than the baryons. And so today, even though there are many more photons, Essentially, the energy content of the universe is dominated by the heavy species, by protons and neutrons. However, then if we, if we think about what's happened in the past, then this, uh, this is changing because the, energy, the average energy of the photons is scaling, as I was saying, like one over the scale factor. And so today, they are, their in typical energy is 10 to the 12 uh, less, they are 10 to the 12 less energetic than baryons, but then if we, we reduce the scale factor by uh, factor 10 to the 3, then the typical energies in photons and in, uh, sorry, yes, in photons or relativity species, relativity species, that is photons and neutrinos, their typical energy density is going to be of the same order of uh, the baryonic energy density. And then we, and we go deeper in the past, then we reach what's called the radiation dominated era, and that's why we have a change of, you see, a change of scaling law because the Hubble uh, equation is modified. But what is important is to realize that at a redshift of 10 to, uh, to the 3, so when we have reduced the scale factor by a factor 1,000, then the typical energies of the photons is of the order of the electron volts. This means that earlier than this time, the photons are too energetic uh, to, sorry, they, they, are, they are so energetic that they prevent the formation of, uh, of a bound state of electrons and nuclei. You cannot form atoms earlier than that, precisely because atoms are going to be broken by these two energetic uh, electrons. Now, if you reduce the scale factor by another, fa by another factor 10 to the 6, instead of having a typical electron volt energy, uh, typical energy for photons, then they're going to have a typical energy of order of the mega electron volt. And then it's the same story again, but this time for nuclei. Earlier than that, the photons are too energetic, and so they're going to break any nucle nucleus you're going to form. So you cannot form nu nuclei earlier than that, because if you form one, then it's going to be destroyed instantaneously by this, all these photons which are too energetic. So here you cannot form nuclei, here you cannot form atom. But it's, somehow it's the same story. Now how do we understand the statistics in the early universe for BBN? It's very, it's very simple. It's, it's the most simple uh, statistical physics. So do this social experiment. I always show these plots. I'm sorry for those who have uh, already seen it. Give the same amount of money to uh, some number of people. So here you give 100 of, I don't know, um, euros or wh whatever you want. So you see the number of people who have 100 euros is uh, the total number. And then nobody else has a different amount of money because Everybody has been given 100 euros. And then you let them exchange freely. They can just trade or sell or give. They can do whatever they want. What's important is that they exchange a lot, very often, that it's conserved, that when you give something, then it's received by another person. There is no loss. And so you see, if there is a lot of exchanges and 
And if money is conserved, then you reach directly, you see the Boltzmann factor, exponential, decre uh, decreasing exponential. So here in that case, what you reach is exponential minus money divided by average money per person, so 100. I've put 100 uh, as an average per person in the beginning, and you find exponential minus m divided by 100. And so it's exactly the same thing which happens uh, during the early universe, except that now, what is conserved is not money, of course, it's energy. In interactions, energy is conserved because of, uh, that's, uh, that's what physics does. And so because energy is conserved, then the statistic obeyed by the, the, by the numbers of, um, of particles is going to follow uh, Boltzmann statistics. So here, I said you need something which is conserved, which is energy, but you need many interactions. And what are the interactions in the early universe which are going to, to control the number of neutrons and the number of protons? These are the weak interactions. So you have this typical interaction, which is neutron plus neutrino gives proton plus electron. And the reverse, proton plus electron gives neutron plus neutrino. And also some crossing symmetry uh, reactions where you put the neutrino on the right hand side, the electron, you, put it, you make it a positron on the left hand side. You put all these reactions together. And if they are strong enough, and since they are weak interactions, you have to, this only applies in the early universe, precisely because they are weak. So you have to be in a very hot and dense universe for this to work. If they are strong enough, then you're going to reach a Boltzmann statistics, that is a number of particles, for instance, could be this one, or neutrons or protons, a number of neutrons is an exponential minus energy of neutrons divided by kVT. Now, <coughs> since we're going to work at atypical energies which have the order of the mega electron volt, because I said that earlier than that, the photons are too energetic, uh, so, and so we cannot produce nuclei, since we're working at energies which are of the order of the mega electron volt, then the, the typical energy of the protons and neutrons is completely dominated by the rest mass energy. You see, the rest mass energy of proton is 938.2 mega electron volt, and for neutrons it's 939.5, so it's larger by 1.3, actually 1.29 mega electron volt. So it's dominated by the rest mass energy, so we can evaluate what's the number density of protons, it's exponential minus 938 divided by kBT, and for neutrons it's exponential minus slightly more divided by kVT. And this slightly more is really crucial because it means that the number density of, of neutrons is the number of density of protons times exponential 1.3 mega electron volt di divided by kBT when kBT is uh, stated in, uh, in mega electron volt. And so here is uh, maybe the most important uh, plot uh, <laughs> of this talk. That's the, so let, let me detail it. That's the neutron abundance. So it's point 0 0.5 when half of baryons are in the state of uh, neutrons, and it's zero if there are no more neutrons. This is time, so 0 0.0 second, 0 0.1 second, 1 second, 10 second, 100 second, 1,000 seconds. And this is the typical, the temperature, 10 to 11 Kelvin, 10 to 10 Kelvin, 10 to 9 Kelvin. What's important to remember is that the, 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 the new system of units, the system of units we are using, is so well made that nearly exactly we have one MeV which is equal to 10 to the 10 Kelvin. And it's very convenient because then it means that 10 to the 9 Kelvin is 0.1 MeV and this is 10 MeV. If you do that, you make an error of about 15%, not more. So 15 is, a, to understand the physics, 15% error is not, a, is, not a, is not a big deal. So what happens here? In dashed line, it's the statistic, statistical equilibrium that I showed you, the exponential minus 1.3 divided by kVT. If you are earlier, it's, if you have a temperature which is much higher than one mega electron volt here, for instance here, 10, to mega, 10 mega electron volt, then you have this exponential factor is nearly one, so you have as many neutrons, or nearly as many neutrons as protons. That's why it's asymptoting to 0 0.5 here. Now when you're reaching 1.3 mega electron volt around here, you see that you have a sizable decrease of the neutron fraction. And then once you have 0 0.1 mega electron volt, clearly, if you have statistical equilibrium, you have no more neutrons left because the exponential, the exponential factor is really um, washing out the, the abundance of neutrons. However, I told you the conditions to have statistical equilibrium is to have enough interactions. And what happens is that around 1 MeV, actually 0 0.8 MeV, these interactions are not strong enough to enforce the statistical equilibrium. And that's why you have the dashed line. That's what happens really. And you are, we are departing from the statistical equilibrium because we don't have enough interactions. So we have a freezing of the abundance. So the abundance should freeze here and reach a plateau. It does not reach a plateau because we still have the neutron beta decay. And this one happens even if the temperature is very low because neutron, uh, that's what they do, the decay, precisely because they have a larger mass. So neutron gives anti-neutrino plus proton plus electron. And this, the typical time scale of this reaction, time scale being defined by exponential minus t divided by tau. So it's not the half time, it's a um, typical time scale. Half time is uh, smaller. Uh, it's 880, 880 seconds. So which means that once you have let's say four times this time scale, 
around 3,000 seconds, you have exponential minus 4. So it's very small. So you see around 3,000, you have reduced the plateau by an exponential minus 4. So you have nearly nothing left. So you see, if this is the true story, then after 3,000 seconds, you have no, no neutrons left. And if you have no neutrons left, you cannot form nuclei, at least not easily. And then you have to do the same thing as in stars, except that you don't have stars, so you cannot form nuclei. But fortunately, that's not what happens. Once you reach, you reach this stage here, then you can form deuterium. You see, it's, uh, it's slightly below 0.1 MeV, and actually it's uh, around 0.07 or 0.08 mega electron volt. And why is it so? It's because I told you that if you have photons which have a typical energy of 2.2 mega electron volt, they can break deuterium. Here you would say, oh, the, the, the temperature of my black body spectrum is 0.1 MeV, so all my photons are my photons are less energetic than 2.2 mega electron volts, so they should not be able to break deuterium, so I should be able, in principle, you would think, I should be able to form deuterium earlier. But the thing is that you have so many more photons than baryons, that in the high energy tail of, of photons, even, even though the temperature is much below 2.2 mega electron volts, you will still have a few ones in the high energy tails able to destroy deuterium. So you have to wait, not that the temperature drops below 2.2 mega electron volts, but actually much lower, 0.07 mega electron volt, and then there, even in the high energy tail of the Planck spectrum, you don't have enough photons to destroy the term, and that's where you form the term. Which means that this part of the curve is wrong. Here, all the neutrons which are there are going to go into deuterium, and so you're not going to be affected by this neutron beta decay anymore. Because once they are in deuterium, they are stabilized, the neutrons. And once they are in deuterium, I've stolen this from Elizabeth, once they are in deuterium, then you can form other reactions. You can have deuterium plus proton gives helium-3, or uh, helium-3 gives uh, plus uh, neutron gives helium-4, deuterium plus neutron gives uh, tritium. You can have all these reactions, and you end up producing nearly entirely helium-4. And when you look at this curve here, at the time where I'm starting to form deuterium, I have 12% of neutrons. So which means that out of 100 baryons, I have 88 which are protons and 12 which are neutrons. Now, to form a helium-4, I'm saying that everything is going to go into helium-4, nearly, nearly everything. To form helium-4, I need two protons <coughs> and two neutrons. So if I have 12 neutrons, I need to take 12 protons, and then I, with this I can form six helium-4. So in mass, I will have taken 24 of the mass is going to be inside helium-4, 24%. If I want to count not in terms of mass fraction, but number fraction, then I would say that I have 6 helium and 76 protons. So the fraction of helium would be 6 divided by 82 in numbers, or 24% in mass. That's why sometimes you see all these uh, different numbers. It depends if you're talking about numbers or mass fraction. Now, it's the same plot, but instead of using a logarithmic uh, scale, I'm using a linear scale. So again, here you see the statistical equilibrium, and then it would go there if uh, the interaction were strong enough, but they are not. So then you reach this plateau, but you don't reach the plateau because you still have the neutron beta decay. And at some point, all the neutrons are eaten by deuterium. So that's why you, you depart from the plateau, from the, from the neutron beta decay. And once they are, they are in heat eaten and they are transformed to deuterium, then deuterium is forming helium-4. And here it's the half of the fraction. Yp divided by 2 is half of the fraction of uh, helium-4. So you can see that all the neutrons are going to helium-4 here. And you see that nucleosynthesis starts around 180 seconds, three minutes, and it ends at 300, uh, 300 seconds. After that, then you, you have no more neutrons left, and if you don't have neutrons, you cannot form nuclei. So, I was really confused by this book, and Akim uh, wrote me a, a mail saying, why are you talking about 300 seconds? Can't you just say five minutes? And then I realized how confused I was, and I lost time in my research because of this book, because I remember these things the first three minutes. And uh, so I really wanted to have the, the nucleosynthesis over by three minutes, and uh, then when I was producing these plots, you know, it was taking 300 seconds. And this was in the back of my mind, these things, uh, the first three minutes, and then I thought, maybe, I, I remember this, the three minutes, I said, oh, maybe, um, I don't remember correctly, maybe it's, um, it's not three minutes. So first, obviously, <laughs> there has to be something wrong here. <laughs> because you cannot use minutes, you have to use seconds. So maybe it's not three, it's three minutes. Then I, I thought that maybe it's something different. And so I think I twisted my mind into thinking that the book I, I remembered uh, seeing in, uh, in some library was 300 seconds. And then in that case, it worked. It's the first 300 seconds. There is a famous citation by uh, an important phys physician here. 
Please? The great thing about Nobel Prize is that you're allowed to make statements which are wrong. There is uh, even uh, something. I'm saying this because I went to see uh, Weinberg's book again, the one about cosmology, and in his book of 72, so this book is about is, uh, 79, something like that. In his book in 72, when you look at the numbers, he's, he's explaining that BBN is over in 280 seconds. So Weinberg knows it's five minutes. So he's really writing three minutes just because he thinks it's, it's more catchy. It's, uh, people, if you said the first five minutes, <laughs> if you said the first three minutes, it's catchy. And because of that, I was confused. So for me, that's why for me it's the first 300 seconds, and that's the way I'm thinking. So now you, you know how to form deuterium, you know to form helium-4. You have a, a few reactions I've showed. Then you have other reactions. You have a whole network of reactions. And then you can form lithium-7, barium-7, lithium-6, and so on and so on. So. What happens is that barium-7 is going to decay in, in a half time of 55 days into lithium-7. So all the barium-7 and lithium-7 that you produce, actually you collect it into uh, only lithium-7 in your final prediction. And the same thing for tritium, which is going to decay into uh, helium-3. So the final predictions you are making are f the prediction for stable elements, because then you have to take into account the <laughs> long time decay. But even though they are long time decay, it's, a, it's such a small time for cosmology that uh, it's all decayed. And so, so yes? So just a quick question. If the binding energy of the proton and the neutron were the same, then what would happen? Sorry, if, the, if the, 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 the mass energy of the protons and neutrons would be the same? Then uh, you would, uh, statistical equilibrium would, would mean that they always have being 50% uh, of neutrons and protons. So you would have uh, just helium-4. <laughs> because you would have as, ma as many neutrons. Oh, yeah. Of course, if you say that, you know, I guess there are many things which change. But I think that if you reduce the, the, the mass gap, you would uh, increase the, number of, uh, the amount of helium-4. So here are the, um, the predictions. So the prediction, you see, they are made in terms of this number, eta. Eta is the ratio between the baryon number and the photon number. I told you it's about 10 to the minus 9. Actually, it's a 6 10 to the minus 9. So it's standard to, to plot 10 to the 10 times eta. So this means a 6 10 to the minus, uh, yes, 6 10 to the minus 9. Uh, 6 10 to the minus 10, sorry. The thing is that if you read Weinberg's book or all, all papers from the 70s, 80s, or 90s, this was unknown. So we, we knew what was the number of photons because we know the temperature of the CMB. And when you have a black body and you know the temperature, you know the number of density. But the, the number of density of baryons was uh, more or less unknown, or at least not, not very precisely. Now, from the baryon acoustic association of the CMB, we know the abundance of baryons very precisely. So that's why I put this Planck line here. Now, it has no meaning to do such plot, but I, I did it because it's a tradition. But now we know for sure what is the baryon fraction. It has to be there. And it's very precise. You see, it's a one sigma uh, constraint from Planck. Now, we're, we're used to make predictions. The blue, the blue are the predictions uh, of, the, of, of our codes for BBN. And so you see, what this prediction means is that since we know the number of variants, actually the prediction is there. And here the prediction is there, there, and there. So here it's for helium-4, deuterium, helium-3, and lithium-7. And the green, the green lines are the one sigma uh, limits of, uh, observa uh, of observation of abundances. So you see, it works very well for helium-4. It works super well for deuterium. I had to make a zoom here. Okay, uh, EM3, it works, so it works well, but the, the bonds are uh, quite large. And for lithium-7, okay, but it doesn't work. This is the famous lithium-7 problem. We don't know why. So you, you, the shape of this curve is really because you have the lithium-7, which is like that, the prediction. You have the barium-7, which is like that. And lithium-7 is the sum of barium-7 and lithium-7 because uh, barium-7 is going to decay into lithium-7. So sometimes people uh, have tried to, to solve this problem of lithium-7 by finding a way to get rid of barium-7, because if you find a way to get rid of barium-7, then you can decrease this part of the curve. But nobody has succeeded so far. So how did we reach these predictions? Now I'm going to talk about the numerics needed to, uh, to, to, to obtain these curves. So first, we need to solve for the plasma and the cosmology. This means we need to know what is the relation between time, scale factor, and temperature. Once we have this, we have the cosmology. Then we need to compute what are the weak rates. They are going to depend on the temp temperature. So that's why we had to solve for the plasma and the thermodynam thermodynamics before, because then once we know the, the temperature, and if we're able to compute what are the weak rates as a function of temperature, then we know them as a function of time or scale factor. And then once we know what are the weak rates, we can plug what are the nuclear reactions, which are also all given as a function of temperature and number density. And then we can solve for the nuclear networks. Why this is valid to do this in three steps and not solve everything at the same time? Because the physics happens everything at the same time. So in principle, you should put all the equations and solve them at the same time. 
Why is it valid to do so? It's because baryons are subdominant. So for instance, if you think about the photons of recombination for CMB, you know, you have proton plus electron gives hydrogen plus a photon. The reason why we can ignore this photon is because since we have 10 to the minus 9, 10 to, 10 to the 9 less baryons than photon, this extra photon that we're going to add to CMB, it's a 10 to the minus 9 distortion, and so it's so too small. And so here is the same idea. The, the neutrinos and the electrons and positrons and the antineutrinos which are involved in the weak interactions, they are not going to change significantly the number of neutrinos and the number of electrons because we have so many, so much less baryons than photons. And so the same, for the, the same thing for the energy released by, weak, uh, by, by uh, nuclear reactions. In nuclear reactions, we have some reactions which uh, release the photons in the final state, or which release kinetic energy, which is somehow going to be transferred to other species. But this is also subdominant because there are not enough uh, baryons in the early universe. So we can really ignore the back reactions of the energy released or taken by nuclear reaction and weak reaction precisely because baryons are subdominant. And that's very convenient. Then, so the first step, how to solve for the cosmology and the, and the thermodynamics. This is very simple. We're saying that all the species which are involved, uh, except the photons, there are fermions. Neutrinos are fermions, antineutrino, positron, electron, neutrons, protons, they're all fermions. So they follow Fermi-Dirac uh, statistics. And uh, so when you have the statistics, Fermi-Dirac statistics, you just plug this into this formula, you get the number density. Into this formula, you get the energy density. And into this formula, you get the pressure. And uh, so it's, it depends only on the temperature. Then you can prove that in the conditions of the early universe, I'm not going to detail that, in the conditions of the early universe, the entropy, rho plus p divided by t, or actually it's the, uh, vol uh, the volume entropy times the volume, so the entropy is conserved. And that's very convenient. Because since this is conserved, and since rho is just a function of temperature, p is a function of temperature, this is a function of temperature, so you have that s is a function of temperature times scale factor to the cube is a constant, which means that this gives you a direct relation between the scale factor and the temperature, which you can invert and have the <coughs> relation between the temperature and the scale factor. You can invert that numerically. So the, the, this conservation of entropy is really a convenient shortcut, and it works very well. It works very well in the early universe. Now, once you have the scale factor as a function of temperature, or more, important, more importantly, the temperature as a function of scale factor, then you can solve the Friedman equation. Why? Because in the right-hand side of the Friedman equation, which gives the, um, the rate of expansion, you have the energy density of, of all the relativity species, electrons, positrons, photons, neutrinos. They all depend on temperature. But now, you've, you've found what is the temperature as a function of the scale factor. So, which means that you plug what is the, this relation from a, for a Fermi-Dirac uh, or for a bose einstein statistics, you replace T by T of A, and then you have a a, s a standard differential equation for the scale factor as a function of time, and then you can solve it. You do that numerically, you get A, the scale factor, as a function of time, and then you invert that numerically, and you get time as a function of the scale factor. And so, now you have all the relations, because you have A of time, T of, T of A, you have A of temperature, temperature of A, so you have all the relations between time, scale factor, and temperature. Now, what are the small effects, the small caveats in this approach, is that if you do, you're using only the Fermi-Dirac uh, statistics for your species, then you are ignoring the, the interaction between the various, uh, the various species. And in fact, okay, here is the propagator of um, the usual vacuum propagator of the electron or the positron. But in fact, the fact that you have a plasma of electron, positron, and photon means that they're going to interact. You're going to have this kind of diagram where you have a photon which is captured, and then which is re-emitted exactly with the same momentum in the bath. And then the same thing, if you have an electron, you have an interaction with a positron which is captured, and then which is uh, released with the same momentum in the bus. So these are, these are called finite temperature corrections to the propagators. So it, somehow it can be translated into a modification of the effective mass of the electron due to the temperature of the bus. And the same thing happens for the photons. This is a vacuum propagator, but you also have these things which is modifying the propagator of the photon, an absorption of a positron or electron, and re-emission into the, the, the plasma with the same momentum. So this changes the, the effective mass of the photon, the effective mass of the, of the electron and positron. So somehow, this can be translated into a modified energy density and a modified pressure, which means that what we did so far was correct, except that we need to correct the energy density and the pressure we have used in the entropy by these corrections, and we need to correct the energy density in the Freeman equation due to that. These are well-documented in the literature, it's just a matter of putting them. 
and this uh, leads to small modifications of the, of the thermodynamics and of the cosmology. Now we have another effect. I showed you that everything happens, the, the, that the, the weak, weak reactions are going to, um, to, to, to freeze around the 1 MeV and that uh, nucleosynthesis is going to start around 0 0.08 MeV. But then we know that the mass of the electron is 0 0.5 MeV, 511 keV. So which means that every, everything happens at the same time. We have this annihilation of electron and positron which are going to give two photons and this equilibrium is going to be displaced on the right once we are below 0 0.5 mega electron volts. And so, if earlier than that, the photons and the neutrinos had the same temperature, and were with temperature which is only scaled, like one over the scale factor due to cosmological expansion, then once this uh, energy from electrons and positrons is released into photons, we are going to increase the, uh, the temperature of the photon. And that's why the, you have the ratio between the neutron temperature and the photon temperature, which is decreasing. So that's the past. That's uh, not, so, not so much the past. <laughs> Time is going like that. So you see they have the same temperature, and then the temperature of the neutrino is lower. I, sh I should have put the reverse plot. It's, it's more like the temperature of the photon is higher, is larger, because of these photons which are uh, generated by the recombination, the annihilation of electrons and positrons. Now, if you do, if you, if you do all the, you compute in detail the reactions, you also have this kind of reactions. Electron plus positron, electron plus positron, sorry, gives neutrino plus antineutrino via weak interactions. And these, the decoupling of this reaction is around 2.3 MeV, so it's not so much uh, it's not so much before, which means that there is a tiny fraction of these reactions of these electrons and positrons which is going to create neutrinos, and so they are not going they are not all going to annihilate into photons, so, which means that this change of temperature between neutrons and photons is going to be slightly altered by the fact that some of the electron positrons are going to neutrinos. This has been computed, been documented in the literature, and so then you can compute what are the corrections, and this changes slightly the evolution of the temperature, so changes slightly your, um, the story of, uh, changes slightly what you have to put in the Friedman equation. But it's, it can be done. So now the weak rates. How do you compute the weak rate? The weak rates are these six reactions. Neutron plus neutrino gives proton plus electron, and the backward reactions, the same, going from the right to the left. Then you have the symmetry crossing reaction, so instead of having a neutrino on the left, you can put an anti-neutrino on, on the right, or you can have an electron on the right that you can make a positron on the left. So you have, in principle, you have eight reactions, but two reactions are impossible energetically. So you have just six reactions. This can be computed with the Born approximation. I'm going to detail very briefly how it's, it's done. But then it's an approximation, and I'm going to show that once, when doing this approximation, there are at least two types of corrections that we need to take into account. There are the so-called finite nuclear mass effects. When you do this kind of approximation, I'm going to, uh, to show briefly, you are neglecting terms which are of order of the temperature divided by the mass of the nucleon. Temperature is of order of the MeV, because I'm saying, I told you that everything happens around the MeV. And the mass of the nucleon is of order of 930-something MeV. So you see it's uh, slightly, it's 0.1% it's somehow. But it depends on the factor which is in front. So it could, uh, and I'm going to show that, in fact, these corrections are of order of 1%. Then you have the radiative corrections, things which are going to involve the loop corrections uh, in your diagram, and since the fine structure constant is 1 over 137, you expect also these radiative corrections to be of the order of, uh, of 1%. So we're going to take this into account to get precise predictions because we want to reach 1% per precision on our predictions. So that's uh, the technical part of this talk. So these are the six reactions. How from the reaction can you compute what is the evolution of the number density? Then you just said that the number density of, for instance, of neutron is affected by dilution and then it's affected by reactions. If you have the re all the reactions which are in exchanging neutrons to protons, first they are proportional to the number density of neutrons, but more importantly they decrease, there is a minus sign, they decrease the number density of neutrons. And then all the reactions which transform protons to neutrons are increasing the number of neutrons. <coughs> you do the same thing for protons except it's, uh, it's, it's the reverse statement. So we need, to, we need to compute what are these reactions. And that's the general formula for, a, for a, the reactions. It's coming from the Boltzmann equation. That's the reaction rate. It's the integral of, of a phase space with a Dirac, which is just stating the conservation of spatial momenta and energy. So this is a form momenta of neutron minus proton plus neutrino minus electron. You have the M square, the, the matrix element coming from the interaction Hamiltonian of the reaction. I'm going to show what it is. And then you have the statistical factor, because you are saying that, for instance, Reactions which are going from neutrons to protons, they are proportional to the distribution function of neutrons. But then there is a 1 minus f of the proton because since protons are 
fermions. If there is already one particle in a given state, you cannot, repopula you cannot populate it twice, so you have a blocking factor 1 minus f. And so for neutrino and electron, it's the same, except that I'm using this uh, compact notation where there is alpha. Alpha is plus 1 if the particle is on the left, and is minus 1 if the particle is on the right. If it's on the left, it's obvious. It's f of the, f of the particle, so it means it's the proportional to the probability of having a particle in the initial state. And if it's a minus 1 in the final, if it's on the final state, it can be understood because for Fermi Dirac distribution, f of minus e is 1 minus f. So putting a negative energy on the left is like putting a positive energy on the right or something like that. So now the question is how to compute this? So first we need to know what is the, the matrix element. So, so I was saying that the reactions which are involved are weak reactions. At the lowest order we can use the Fermi, uh, the Fermi description of uh, weak interactions. And so this is a typical weak interaction, which is mediated by the boson vector. What we're saying is that since we're working at, at energies which are order of the mega electron volt, and the, the fact that the typical mass of the vector boson is of the order of 90 giga electron volt, then clearly we can assume that instead of having these two, two three-leg vertices, we can describe it effectively as a four-leg ver vertex, and that's the Fermi uh, theory of weak interactions then it can, be, we can, it can be shown that, in that case, the, the interaction Hamiltonian is put in the shape of a coupling of two currents, a cu this current here and this current. You have the neutrino electron current. So it's, it's a current which is exchanging an electron to a neutrino or anti-neutrino to a positron or something like that. And then you have the neutron to proton current, which looks very similar, but still it's very different. Because you see this electron-neutrino current, it's only left chiral. That's why you have this gamma mu, 1 minus ga gamma 5, you, rec you recognize the left chiral uh, operator. For neutron to proton, there, is, there are two modifications. First, there is a weak magnetism that you need to take into account if you're looking for small effects. I'm not going to detail that. And most importantly, and most notably, there is this fact that instead of having 1 minus gamma 5, due to the internal structure of the proton and neutron, the interaction is not purely left chiral. So if GA was 1, it would be purely left chiral, but GA is 1.27 something. So you have a left chiral and a right chiral part. And to complicate things even further, you know that the weak interactions that do not couple nicely the, dumb, the down and the up quarks directly. You have this Kabibo kobayashi maskawa uh, uh, matrix. And in, in, in our case, what we, what we need is the angle VUD, the, um, the component UD, up down of this Kabibo kobayashi maskawa that I've, put, that I've written here as co cosinus theta. And this is not one, it's 0 0.97 something. So you have all these complications. But <coughs> in this interaction, in this, uh, sorry, with, with this simple form of the, of the coupling, you see, the, I'm just contracting the two currents, you can, you can show that the M square, the matrix element, is qu quite simple. It has a left-left carol coupling, a right-right carol coupling, and a left-right coupling. So you see the, the, the constant in, in front of the coupling, the left-left, okay, so it's this one, the right-right, it's this, and you see that if GA is one, this is zero. And the left-right as well, if GA is 1, it's 0. So you see you have no right-right or left-right if there is only, of course, a left chiral uh, coupling in the neutron proton. But if there is, and it's the case, then you have these returns. But they are not too complicated when you look at, at them. It's just some contraction of the momenta, and it's really simple. It's just, you see, uh, the, the first one, uh, it's the, the, the neutron with the neutrino contracted, and then the proton with the electron contracted. So the, the, the shape of this matrix element is very simple. Okay. Now, how can we make simplifications? We know that we're going to have a Dirac, which is stating the conservation of energies. The simplification we can make is that the energy difference between the neutrons and protons is essentially just the mass difference, because they are, they are not relativistic. So we're going to simplify. When, whenever we have energy of neutron minus energy of proton in the Dirac of conservation, we're going to replace that by the mass of neutron minus the mass of proton, including that delta, it's 1.3 mega electron volt, plus some tiny corrections. Okay, and then I'm going to ignore the corrections uh, uh, first. So you see, I'm going to replace this by mass of neutron minus mass of proton. So I'm going to simplify this uh, Dirac. I'm going to say it's Dirac of this, where this time I've replaced by mass of neutron minus mass of proton, plus energy of electron minus energy of neutron. And so as a first computation, the Born approximation, I'm going to neglect all these corrections. Now, at the first computation of this m square, when you look at the, the form I've showed you for m square, and actually when you divide by the energies, and you had to divide by the energy because it was there in the phase space element, you find that at lowest order, it's 1, 1, 1. You can remove all the questions. So it's very simple. It's 1. Here it's a very simple Dirac. And here you have the, um, the, the, the distribution function. 
Now you are using the extra assumption that you are working in a homogeneous and isotropic universe, so all the distribution functions do not depend on the direction of momenta and just on the magnitude of the momenta. If you do that, you're removing, you see for instance, you're removing the angular dependence here, so two-dimensional algebra, you're removing the angular dependence here and here, so you're removing a lot of things, and in the end, what you find is that the rate in this approximation is just a one-dimensional integral, it's a constant, an integral on the momenta of the electron, and then some functions which depends on the distribution function of neutrinos and electrons. What's important here, what I want to say, is this constant here. This constant is proportional to the GW. GW is the weak, is the Fermi constant times this Kabibo Kobayashi mask of angle. And it's proportion, and it's related, it's, sorry, in this expression, there is of course GA which is appearing, because it was in the expression of the Hamiltonian. So there is one plus three GA squared. So it's very, it's very simple. If we know VUD, and if we know GA squared, given that we know what's the Fermi constant, then we're able to compute this. And it makes a lot of ifs, and I'm going to, to comment on this uh, many ifs. Then we can compute it, and we look for what it is. In red, it's the neutron to proton rate. In blue, it's the proton to neutron rate. And in, in a dashed line, it's the Hubble rate. And you see, so that that's early time, that's late time, because high temperature, low temperature, so time is going like that. Around 1 MeV, remember, 1 MeV is 10 to the 10 Kelvin. You see that the rates are, are dropping below the Hubble rate. So somehow it means that the, the, inter the interactions are frozen or they are not strong enough to enforce statistical equilibrium. And that's why below 1 MeV, we start to depart from st statistical equilibrium. This, I don't have time for this. Then there are the corrections I showed you. Oh, in this, this computation, I've neglected many things. Okay, if I don't neglect these many things, then I can compute the corrections. And these are the finite nuclear mass corrections. What is important is to know how much is going to affect the rate. And this is a relative relation of the rate, delta gamma divided by gamma, due to these corrections. And you see, around 1 MeV, here it's 10 to the 10 Kelvin, so that's, that's when I'm going to have decoupling, at around 0 0.8 MeV. You can see that the corrections to the rates are of order of 1%. So this is a neutron-proton rate, this is a proton-neutron rate. So which means that since the time of decoupling is controlling the abundance of uh, neutr neutrons which are left, then changing the rates by, uh, uh, let's say, around 1% is going to change the abundance of neutrons by order 1%, and this is going to change helium-4 by, we expect, 1%. So th th this, this first set of uh, corrections is, is very important. Then we have all the relative corrections. I told you the fine structure constant is 1 over 137, so whenever we have uh, a relative correction, we have to take into account. So, so far, we have worked only with this lowest order diagram. I told you that we can neglect this propagator of the vector boson, and we work with this four-leg diagram. Now we have all these diagrams, which are higher order, with loops, you see, and they all have, here it's a vertex of uh, the QED, so you have EE, uh, EE, EE, e, e. so when I combine this diagram with this diagram, I have an E squared, so I have a fine structure constant. So combining this with this, 1 over 137, this with this, the same, this with this. So you have to compute all this, and you expect a correction which is of order 1%. When you do the, the, do the computation, it's been done a lot in the literature since the 60s. Around 1 MeV, 10 to the 10 Kelvin, you see that the correction to the rate, this is delta gamma over gamma, so the relative correction to the rate due to this relative correction, you see it's of order 2.5%. So it's really important because 2.5% is going to modify clearly the abundance of neutrons and the, hence the abundance of uh, helium-4. Then you have other diagrams. You see, you, you have this diagram which has only one vertex, emission of a true photon, or absorption of a true photon. This is Bremsstrahlung, this is absorption of a photon which is from the bath. So this, this diagram exists in the vacuum, this diagram does not exist in the vacuum, it's really, you absorb, sorry, you absorb a photon in the plas uh, of, the plasma, of the plasma. They all have one vertex, but if you combine them, then it's going to, you're going to have two vertices, so you're going to have, again, the fine structure constant, E squared. So you can compute what are the effects, you have other diagrams, this one, this one, you can compute the effects. They're all of the order of the fine structure constant. And you can compute what is the total corrections of these uh, new diagrams, and you see it's the green line. It's very small, because at 10 to the 10 Kelvin, when you compute everything, in dashed line, it's the neutron to proton rate. No, continuous line is neutron to proton, and dashed line is proton to neutron. And you see, the relative variations due to this large diagram is very small. So this is not going to affect significantly the, the reaction rates, and thus not significantly the neutron abundance. When you compute everything together, you add them, all, all the effects, you find that the corrections are of the order of uh, 3%. See, red is neutron to proton, and blue is proton to neutron, and that's about the time of decoupling here, 10 to the 10 Kelvin. Now, once you've done that, 
you fully understand in details what are the weak interactions and this how, how they control the neutron abundance. Now you need to add the nuclear network. I told you it's in a three-step thing. You need to add the nuclear network. So you put all these reactions and you solve them at the same time. So how do you solve these reactions? It's, you just solve for the flows which are, you know, for interactions. So the flows are given. So you work with the abundances, which, uh, which is the ratio between uh, an abundance of a given species I divided by the total abundance of, uh, of, baryons, of, nu of nucleons. And it's just chemistry. You're saying that the, the way it varies is just the sum of all reactions which end up producing this element, and it's proportional to the initial uh, number of densities of that reaction, minus all the reactions which destroy these uh, elements, and again, it's proportional to the number of density of the initial elements of that reaction. So you just sum all these arrows here, all these arrows, and you solve jointly this system of equations. So it's a huge system of equation, but it's ordinary differential equation. What is interesting is that you can understand the numerics you get, at least partly, is that at very early time, interactions are so, so efficient that they enforce, again, equilibrium. But this time, it's going to be nuclear statistical equilibrium that they enforce. And you can compute what is the nuclear statistical equilibrium. It's just basic statistics. It looks complicated, but it's really, really simple. And you find that there is a formula. If it's, it's strong enough, then the number of density must be given by this. It depends on the, the abundance of protons, of neutrons, on the binding energy of, uh, the, given, uh, of the given nucleus you are considering, and uh, on the spins. But apart from that, it's simple. And so here, you see, I'm already showing you uh, partly the results at early time, between one, one seconds and 100 seconds. And you see for various species in dashed line, it's this nuclear statistical equilibrium formula that I showed you in the previous slide. So you see that. I always wonder what was this funny shape in the BBN curves that you could see in the literature. And you see the, the first, here the first knee, I don't know how you call that, the first bump, is really the time where statistical equilibrium cannot be enforced for a given species. And for deuterium, you see it's enforced very, very late. Actually, the, the dashed line, which is nuclear statistical equilibrium and the continuous <coughs> line, they're going to match very late because precisely uh, deuterium, it's, uh, it's difficult to produce it. But for other species, the departure is, uh, is much earlier. So you, you see, we understand the numerics because we can check that the numerics at early time converges or at least reproduces the, the, what, it should, what we should get from statistical equilibrium. We're, we're using uh, many more species than the one I showed. Actually, instead of using just this small network, we're able to use a large network made of uh, carbon, uh, uh, azote, uh, oxygen, uh, and up to uh, natrium. So if, since we have many nuclei, we also have many reactions. We have more than 400 reactions. And this is the, uh, the work done by Elisabeth Von Juni and Alan Cox. They have not uh, worked on that. They have collected all the reactions from tables, from papers dating back from the 60s. So it's a very long work to, uh, to have a collection of all these reactions which are needed. But then once you put all the reactions together and you solve them jointly with the weak interactions, then this is what you get. So you see at the beginning, I showed you that we understand these things. These are nuclear statistical equilibrium. And then it's out of equilibrium production. So let me comment on this, uh, on this uh, plot, which is the second most beautiful plot after the CS of the CMB. Here is the neutrons. You see the neutrons are decaying like that. The, here, the, sorry, they are disappearing because they are eaten by deuterium. So they decay because of statistical equilibrium. Then they decay here because of neutral beta decay. But here, if they disappear, the neutron is really because they are eaten by deuterium. And deuterium is here. It's in red dashed line. You see, it's produced. It's taking the neutrons. But then, once the deuterium is formed, then it's used to form helium-4. And that's why helium-4 is catching here, and it's overtaking deuterium, and then everything ends up into helium-4. And that's why deuterium has to decrease. And today, deuterium is about 10 to minus 5. So it was much larger in the intermediate stage, but then it was eaten, and so it has decreased to 10 to minus 5. Then you have other species. You have helium-3. Then you have lithium-7 here and barium-7. And I told you that we need to add all this, this this species, because barium-7 is going to decay into lithium-7, so we need to add the, these two curves. And then you have all the lighter species. You can compute what is, what is the abundance of barium, bore, and everything, and you can see it's, in all cases, very small, so it means that all these species are not significantly produced during the BBN. This is just to show you that we did a lot of work and that uh, this uh, justified uh, writing a paper about it. When you put all the corrections to the, to the weak rate, you find that the, the total corrections, that's only the number which is important, the total correction to helium-4 is 1.85%, and the total correction to deuterium is 1.49%. So you, you see, really, computing what are the corrections is important because we have measurements, I showed you, which are, which are also of the order of the percent. Now, question, what are the sources of uncertainties? 
Now, let me come back to the ifs. I said, oh, if we know, if we know. Okay. Let me come back to the if. The constant which is in, in front is the, weak, the, the Fermi constant times the Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa angle. So here, GW is G Fermi times VUD. So first, there is the first uncertainty. What is VUD? Uh, it happens that VUD, the Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa angle, is known with very good precision, at least much better precision than GA, the Excel current. So what people have done in the past is saying that since we don't have a good precision on the GA, we are going to use the neutron lifetime as a proxy to measure GA because the neutron lifetime is also related to this constant. It's some number which involves all the corrections, loop corrections and everything. It has been computed with great detail since the 60s. We know how to relate this constant to the neutron lifetime because the neutron lifetime also involves this combination 1 plus 3 GA squared. So if we measure the neutron lifetime, which we do in the experiment, then we have an information on GA squared. It happens that re over the, the, the recent years, we now have measurement of GA squared, which are as good as the measurement on the neutron lifetime. So we can either use the neutron lifetime as a proxy to measure GA squared, or we can use directly the measurement from GA squared. And they are compatible. That's what is interesting, because what we get from this, which we know there is great precision, and this is compatible with this. So it's the first time in the history of BBN that it starts to make sense. You know, in the past, there was a lot of debate about the neutron lifetime, and so, for instance, you, when you look at Weinberg's book in the 70s, um, he's using thousands, thousand seconds for the neutron lifetime. This has changed a lot, and people didn't know really what to do. Now, finally, the measurement of VUD, GA squared, and 2N makes sense. They satisfy this uh, coherence relation. Then, the other, the other source of uncertainty, of course, coming from all the nuclear rates we're putting in our network. Now, my last slide. What can we do with BBN? Okay, it's fine, we have abundances, but I haven't talked what we're doing. The reason why I worked on that is because it's one of the three pillars of cosmology, and I wanted to understand the, this because I wanted to understand cosmology. Why is it so important for cosmology? On one hand, you could say we just have really two numbers because the measurement on helium-3 is not so good and lithium-7 is really bad. So we have deuterium and helium-4. But still, with two numbers, we can constrain two cosmological parameters. And it happens that BBN is sensitive to the baryon uh, fraction and also sensitive to the effective number of neutrinos. By effective number of neutrinos, I mean the number of relativistic species during BBN. So you have two numbers, and you have two measurements, so you can make ellipses. So you see in um, this, I uh, cannot see the color, I think it's red. You have the ellipse for a baryon fraction and number of uh, neutrinos, effective number of neutrinos, with BBN alone, and in green with CMB, and in black it was CMB and BBN combined. You can marginalize, and you have okay, the marginalized value of, fortunately, it's three, because <laughs> we recovered our three neutrinos, which is really good. And also you recover the, the number of baryons as measured from BBN, it's the red curve. It's really not very far, it's really compatible with what you measure from CMB, which is the green curve. And the combination is the, is the black curve. So BBN is not doing as good as CMB, of course. But what is interesting is it's not really that it's improving slightly uh, the measurement by combining the, the data, it's not really this. What is really interesting is that it's coherent. The physics, which is constrained by the number of neutrinos, happens one second. I don't like to say after the Big Bang. Okay, one second. In the first second. And um, it's a very, very different physics from the physics from the CMB, where this is constrained from free streaming of neutrinos and how neutrinos affect the growth of structure and everything. So we have physics which are very, very different times and they are coherent in the way they, they constrain the number of neutrinos. And the same for the number of baryons. The baryon acoustic oscillations, they're going to, to happen much later when the modes enter the Hubble horizon and start to oscillate. And here, the baryon fraction enters in a very different way. The, 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 the abundance prediction. And this is coherent, what you, num what you measure for the number of neutrinos and for, the, for, for the, the baryon fraction from BBN and from CMB is coherent, even though this is completely different physics and completely different time. So wh whenever somebody um, doesn't believe the, cosmog the standard cosmological model, you should uh, show this. And uh, thank you very much. Merci Cyril. Je crois que toutes tes citations n'étaient pas tout à fait correctes, mais on en discutera plus tard. Vous avez des questions pour, euh, pour Cyril oui. I think I have two. So, um, I guess one important thing right now is to understand there are different codes that are measuring all of or predicting BBNs, uh, abundances, and I guess what's, what's the main 
point, I guess, uh, where there is disagreement in the community of how treating things. And I guess the second point is, um, what do you have to do to go down in your um, uncertainties, um, I guess, for next generation observations and, and experiments? Right now, you are at 0.1%, I guess, on, on helium. Um, and, and, and measurements are, I guess, abundances are measured at the level of percent, and CMB is 10%, and I guess next generation is going down, so we'll need even better, I guess. Yes, so thank you for, for the question. So the disagreement between the codes, it's, it's very well understood in the sense that some part of the disagreement is coming from the table of nuclear rates that you're putting in, so of course, this is a way of, you have to, you have to, be, to, to keep rates which are up to date with literature. But then, apart from that, then there are clearly d disagreements which just are clearly coming from the, the, the amount of um, corrections you're putting in your code. So, the, the, in the standard code, they are putting Born approximation, and then they are putting radiation, radiative corrections. And even for the radiative correction, you have various ways to add them. You see this changes slightly instead of 1.27, 1.3. And so, people were aware that there was a series of corrections which are, had been computed separately in the literature and that they could not put in their code, so they were adding a number at the end, a fudge factor or uh, an offset. So for instance, there's some code they were adding a factor uh, 18, you see. Uh, so when I say 18, I mean uh, for the last, uh, I mean for this uh, third and uh, fourth digit, to account for uh, finite mass corrections, which are here, these corrections, or to account for QD plasma, I told you, the fact that uh, it's a QD effect, or the incomplete neutrino, the incomplete decoupling of neutrinos as well. People were adding some, um, they, they were collecting the effects from the literature saying, oh, okay, it's small, so let's hope they add linearly. It should be 18, so let's put it 18. But then you, you find that some effect, they combine non-linearly, so just adding them makes a small, small difference. But even when you compare the, the various codes in the literature, literature once you, you take this fudge factor they add, the disagreement is very small between the codes. Then also, disagreement is, bit, sometimes it's really just between the neutron lifetime which is used. People tend to use the 880.2, but then the last measurement uh, tend to say it's 879.6, and you see it makes a, so a difference. So. And so for the, for the, uh, so the, for the corrections, uh, uh, in principle, then you would need to go to second order radiative corrections. Uh, okay, um, I already have a problem with one loop uh, correction, so <laughs> I'm not going to make second loop corrections, two loop corrections, but uh, what's going to dominate, uh, I think, the, the, the corrections are going to be radiative corrections at two loops, and then more importantly, you will start to, uh, if you want to, to go below 10 to minus 4, let's say 10 to minus 5, you will start to have to deal with inhomogeneous cosmology. So for modes which are super horizon, you can still argue that you have a separate universe approach, and so since for adiabatic uh, initial conditions, the mixing, the, 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 the proportion of um, baryons and of photons is the same if it's adiabatic uh, fluctuation. So it's not sensitive to fluctuation for these modes, but for modes which are not superable, then you could have diffusion from this region, and so then you will have to do, I don't know, like people did for CMB, perturbative uh, BBN, blah, blah. So at 10 to minus 5, we will have this problem of uh, inhomogeneous cosmology. Uh, yeah, um, for um I mean, uh, apart from neutron, for other elements, do you consider the confinement effect and effect of a strong interaction, uh, or do you use a sort of a structure function for them, or something like that? You mean for the rates? Uh, yes, because you are obliged to, to, uh, to uh, because you cannot uh, calculate the, uh, the non-perturbative part, then you, you should use a sort of a structure function then I don't know what you use. Do you, do you, you mean for the, use for the nuclear rates? Yes. Oh, for the nuclear rates, it's from tables. I mean, it's just from experiments. I mean, most of them, it's from experiments. You have, ah, you have okay. experiments okay. of cross-section. So from okay. the cross-section, you can, well, you put the statistics and you get the rates. Okay, therefore you don't, you don't uh, it's, add it's, anything it's, it's, in, in it's, your calculation? It's physics, which is really under control. One MeV is a lot, but it's nothing one MeV. It's just put, uh, okay. you go to Orsay, you put one megavolt. <laughs> And uh, no, but it's really small. I was, I was surprised because I thought, oh, it's nuclear physics, super complicated. No, one MeV is, is nothing. One JeV is a lot, one TeV. Uh, but one MeV, it's just one mega electron volt. You put ions, they accelerate, and you have one MeV. So you put a target, and then you have a, um, you know, with a magnetic field, like you, you, compute the, you compute the mass with a, a, a spectrometer, the mass, with a mass spectrometer. And uh, you look at the deflection angle or things like that, and you get a cross-section as a function of angle. I mean, it's, very, it's, very, it's very simple. I mean, it's just that 
the, the problem is not uh, the nuclear rates, it's the problem is that you have so many rates and you need to measure them, I each one of them to make an experiment, you need to convince people that this reaction is more important and it's critical. And it's the, most pro the most I, I problematic is uh, how you consider the, uh, I mean, you, you separate between perturbative uh, the reaction and non-perturbative reaction that you must then consider their cross-section from experiments. This is, I think, the, uh, I think the most uh, important, uh, uh, I mean... I think I, I don't understand what you mean by perturbative and non-perturbative. For me, there is just the Boltzmann equation with collision term. A collision term okay. is uh, cross-section. Uh, yeah. It's chemistry. I, 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 in my slide, I wrote nuclear history. It's, just, it's the same formalism as chemistry. <laughs> This could be a discussion for coffee. Yeah, I'm sorry, it was a great talk. I really appreciated very much how you always try to make uh, kind of qualitative arguments. Usually in these kinds of talks, I come away ha ha having the impression that I understood nothing, but so I understood uh, a little bit. But I have just kind of a general question. Imagine we get to a situation where there are a lot more observations. I don't know what, uh, what, what's the prospect for improving our knowledge, experimental knowledge of uh, elemental abundances in the early universe, but could you ever imagine we would get to a stage whereby there could be some constraint on fundamental physics? I mean, you already talked about a better knowledge of the um, uh, neutrino, uh, li neutron lifetime. Uh, do you have some kind of like general thought about that? Well, for BBN, uh, you're very sensitive to the number of relativistic degrees of freedom. So whenever you have a theory, I don't know, uh, dark matter, if it's too light, then if it's relativistic during BBN, it's killed. So. The constraint from BBN, uh, from fundamental physics, is really this. Is if you have a new degrees of freedom, for instance, if you have a force, if you have a force neutrino, you have, it's possible, but then you have to argue it's, uh, it's non-thermal, because if it's thermal, then you have, four, you have four degrees of freedom and you're way out. So this constraint from the number of relativistic degrees of freedom is very strong. For instance, you can see there were, I've seen paper for uh, gravitational waves, uh, probable gravitational waves and some models, fancy models, blah, 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 of uh, modified gravity. Then they had some constraint just because gravitational waves can be considered as particles, as a relativistic degree of freedom, some kind of back reaction uh, effect. Then, from this constraint that it had to be 3 plus or minus uh, 0 0.2, you exclude the region of this theory. So, it's, uh, the, the, the killing power of BBN is uh, NF. Do we, uh, so, a naive question. Um, uh, you. I was wondering whether when you started the extra corrections, the QED corrections on that, which is a lot of work and it's a very beautiful work, I was wondering whether you had in mind that perhaps this might uh, relieve the, the, the tension between the BBN and CMB cons uh, constraints on uh, 7LI, lithium. And, uh, and, and, and if they don't, uh, how do we explain them? The tension with what you said with? On lithium. On lithium 7? <laughs> Now, with lithium-7, we've tried everything, uh, it's, it's, it's Because impossible. we cannot talk about uh, future evolution in stars, because this is early universe, right? So CMB is a little bit later, but can, the, can, can no, but one imagine that lithium changes from the from, uh, 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 300 seconds to the 5 minutes to the uh, 300,000 years? On lithium-7, I have no clue, really. I mean, uh, for, me, for me, what's important is that we measure less when it, what is produced, since it's destroyed, it's reassuring, but... Um, Really, uh, it's, it's impossible. I, even playing with the fundamental constants, saying, okay, we don't care about the electron mass, the binding energy of deuterium, the mass gap between proton and neutron, I've tried to play with that. We've tried, we've tried, trying to find, okay, maybe there is a fancy part of the, these parameters which produces exactly what we need, and uh, it doesn't work. So, lithium-7, uh, really, uh, I and then I have a my, my bet is that it's a measurement problem, so also. I have a cosmic engineering question, of, yes. if I may. When you solve for all the terms here, do you do it jointly or in an iterative process? You mean the, the, the nuclear reactions? Yes, when you do the, oh, the last line, for example. D don't I mean, uh, the last line is all the corrections are taken at the same time. So okay, yes. it's joint. Yes, yes. Okay, I have a question on the issue 7. So, uh, <laughs> is there any other question, but not on lithium 7? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> lithium 6? <laughs> ah, okay. A question, a philosophical question almost, but given that we still have this lithium problem, in your view, 
uh, what is the, 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 the key factor? Is that a, somehow a blocking factor compared to the other successes of the theory? Is that a, a, a pebble in your shoe? Or you say it's a measurement problem. But, uh, for me, it's a measurement problem. Well, yeah, or, or I mean, stellar problem for you, that you, matter. You look at matter stars, of destruction, whatever. You look at stars, you're saying, okay, they are old. I hope there is not too much convection, and what I'm seeing is the outer, uh, the outer layer, and then I'm measuring the lithium seven from there. If there is convection, it's destroyed. I mean, if, if you don't know the, correctly the stellar, for me, if I was working in stellar physics, I would work the other way. I would say, my model of stellar physics should be such that the lithium seven seen these stars should be that much. Instead of saying, oh, I understand my models, I trust my bundles, and uh, no, no, lithium seven is not destroyed, so no, I would say, BBN works so well, DGM7 should be that much. If you see less in stars, then it means that there is some thing which is destroying it, and uh, there are some convection it's coming from the outer layer to the inside, destroyed, reshuffle in the outer layer, and then your models over the long evolution of the stars you observe, I don't know, you should explain that. I mean, I would use that as a point for stellar physics. I think this has been tried without success so far, but... Yeah, I know, it's complicated. <laughs> but it, what I mean is but that anyway, this, this okay. measurement is different from the helium-3, uh, helium Sorry, from helium-4 and deuterium, it's, uh, we use stars. For, for deuterium, we use absorption line from quasars in the intergalactic medium, and we say, okay, it's more or less pristine, and we, assume the, we estimate the amount of non-pristiness by the amount of uh, iron and oxygen, so, but uh, for lithium-7, it's really far-fetched if we're using stars. So. That's why, uh, I mean, uh, in cosmology, I mean, uh, we don't want to criticize too much astrophysicists, but we... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, don't believe the stars, but believe the Big Bang. <laughs> Where, where, where is BS. it? What is it, BS? <laughs> BS, BS. <laughs> <Can't you? laughs> okay. Here he is. So I think we, we shall thank Cyril again. Merci beaucoup. And as I said, he's around, so you can go and question him anytime. And there is a couple of uh, um, uh, tiré à part of the physics report ah, yes. if, you, if you want.